I am an American soldier. I'm a warrior and a member of a team. I serve the people of the United States and live the Army values. I will always place the mission first. I will never accept defeat. I will never accept defeat. I will never quit. I will never leave a fallen comrade. I am disciplined. I am disciplined. Physically and mentally tough. Trained and proficient in my warrior tasks and drills. I always maintain my arms, my equipment, and myself. I'm an expert, and I'm a professional. I stand ready to deploy, engage, and destroy the, the enemies of the United States of America in close combat. I am a guardian of freedom and the American way of life. I am an American soldier. I am an American soldier. I am an American soldier. I am Army Strong. They're strong, and there's Army Strong. See what it takes at GoArmy.com. Sometimes riders feel lost, unsure why a passage may not be working. It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our riding into full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable riders to develop and grow, offering manuscript critiques and line edits through a mentoring editorial style. We also offer assistance on generating a rider's bio for your websites. Black Wolf Editorial Services, nurturing your riding into maturity. For a full list of services, visit blackwolfeditorial.com. Hey folks, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine, Dr. Richard Harden. We are on the same mission, which is Waking Up America. We just have different paths. So stay tuned for some information on how you can keep up with Richard and all his work. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. Every day, the men and women of the United States Marine Corps stand ready to defend the American way of life, the few, the proud, the Marines. The following message contains a special offer for listeners of this station. Are you a man over 40? Are you constantly looking for the nearest bathroom? Do you wake up multiple times a night to use the bathroom? Right now, Perfect Prostate is sending out free bottles of their groundbreaking new formula to listeners of this station. Perfect Prostate formula was developed by medical doctor Mitchell Fleischer, and its ingredients have been clinically studied to reduce your frequent nighttime bathroom visits and promote healthy urine flow. Right now, preferred customers get their first bottle of Perfect Prostate absolutely free. There's nothing to lose. Perfect Prostate is guaranteed to reduce that constant urge to use the bathroom, especially at night, and promote healthy urine flow. Don't wait. Call now for your free bottle. Just pay shipping and processing. Dial 1-800-675-0251. That's 1-800-675-0251. Supplies are limited. One free bottle per household. Call now. Dial 1-800-675-0251. That's 1-800-675-0251. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. You're listening to the Spark Radio Network, internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. My name is Jesse. I'm a United States Special Forces widow. This gives me a unique perspective on the world around us. If you're willing to listen, I'll tell you how I see it, and I won't pull any punches. This is my POV, which stands for Point of View. All right, this is Jesse. I'm so happy to be back with you guys. My head is reeling with everything that has been fully disclosed in the last 24 hours. 
My head is absolutely reeling. There's been so much doublespeak, so many press statements that you have to read between the lines on. And yes, I know the people who work at the different press offices are experts in doublespeak, but boy, they're working overtime. Their doublespeak's gone to triple speak. And I am not kidding you. It has gone bonkers. Absolutely bonkers. Now, before I get into all the chaos that is going on in the world, as I usually do, Scott Harvath, you got this year, brother. You got it. This is the year you kick your cancer to the curb and you get to spend the rest of your life happily with your family. All right? Stay in the fight, brother. Stay in the fight. And for those of you who are new listeners to my show and do not regularly tune in, Scott Harvath is someone I have friended on Twitter and become somewhat close with. He is a retired New York Police Department sergeant battling stage 4 esophageal cancer. So the only thing I ever ask of you other than to tune in here on on to listen to me explain what is going on in this crazy world is to give him a shout out, say hi, send some positive words his way. You can find him on Twitter at S-C-O-T-T-H-A-R-V-A-T-H. Yes, that is at Scott Harvath. And for those of you readers of Brad Thor thrillers, this particular Scott spells his name with two T's, not one. All right. Moving right along. Yes, I've got my show prep. I am just absolutely reeling at the amount of chaos that has come out in the past 24 hours. I'm sitting here going, oh my gosh. It's such a big news day. I'm having my trouble wrapping my head around it. This is one of those days where if I could run long, I probably would. But what I am going to do, and I promise you this will happen because I'll start on it as soon as I get off the air with you. I'm going to finish up today's story, do my best to connect all the dots with what I have in front of me, and then I've got some more research to do that I didn't get time to do before my show. So I'm going to, after I get off the air, work on a supplementary show. I'll see about getting aired tomorrow. Got to check with Station Manager and she's a stickler for schedules. All right, some of the crazy headlines from today. Two former military officers in Turkey have been sentenced to prison. Benjamin Netanyahu was questioned by police. And... The Israeli military is at odds with the politicians because a soldier was found guilty of killing a Palestinian who had been wounded. Now, there's various disputes on that. We will get into that momentarily. The big news, the big two news stories of the day were the cyber terrorism hearing which I have not had time to watch all two and a half hours of. I've gotten two large chunks of it, but I don't have it all. And four Gitmo detainees have been transferred to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And I think there's more to come. I really do. I think... President Barack Obama is going to do his darndest to leave that place as empty as he can. That's why in a press briefing back in December, there was a notification sent to Congress. And one of the reporters caught on that it was sent. Because remember, President Obama has to notify Congress 30 days in advance of prisoner transfers. Now... 
The White House press secretary said, I can't get into specifics. Have a nice day. You know, can't tell you about it. There may be something. Look over there. Don't look here. But this is nuts. All right. Here's just some of my show prep for the day. Like I said, I don't have as much of it as I would like. Because I got caught up trying to research some of some specific stories and let other ones go. But we are going to All right. Get into We're going to start with the small stories and get to the big ones in just a moment. There's been some new Mosul Raqqa updates. Yes, I know I just gave you one yesterday. But there's been new ones. All right. So I like to bring you as much as I can. And you know me, I like to bring you as many original sources. So I scour the press conferences, listen to a lot of it and try and bring you the relevant clips. Just getting everything pulled up. Am I ever perfectly organized? Come on, you guys wouldn't know what to do and you wouldn't have any laugh time. I'm going to leave that one. That one may be relevant today. I've got one about the Syrian dam, and I've got a clip that references it. So, we're going to start off with one that doesn't necessarily go to Mosul, but I feel it's important to play for you and dissect it. So, let's start off with that. And separately, on the deployment front, the United States is demonstrating its continued commitment to collective security through a series of actions designed to reassure NATO allies and partners of America's dedication to enduring peace and stability in the region in light of the Russian intervention in Ukraine. Tanks, trucks, and other equipment are scheduled to arrive in Europe this weekend, beginning a nine-month rotation of U.S. Army forces supporting Operation Atlantic Resolve. The arrival of troops and equipment from 3rd Armor Brigade Combat Team, 4th Infantry Division out of Fort Carson, Colorado, marks the beginning of the continuous presence of an ABCT and back-to-back rotations of U.S. troops and equipment in Europe. After the equipment arrives at Bremerhaven, Germany, it will move by rail, commercial line haul, and military convoy to Poland. The personnel and equipment will later be relocated throughout the region for training and exercises with European allies. This effort is part of our European Reassurance Initiative to maintain persistent rotational presence of air, land, and sea forces in Central and Eastern Europe. And with that, I'd be happy to take your questions. Lita Baldor. Sorry, I didn't cut that clip as closely as I should have, but you guys will cope. All right. Troops would start flying out to Europe this week. And the flights will continue for about two weeks. While specific locations were not mentioned, it does say that the U.S. Armored Brigade will be flown to Europe this week as NATO bolsters its eastern flank, fears amid potential Russian aggression. Give you the numbers. That's about 4,400 American soldiers from the 3rd Armored Brigade. And U.S. soldiers will conduct exercises in, quote, various locations in Eastern Europe. U.S. troops will be deployed in Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, as well as Poland. Originally, the American troops were to arrive in Central and Eastern Europe at the end of January and the start of February. Outgoing President Barack Obama speeded up the operation so that President-elect Donald Trump 
could not stop the moves. Personally, I think this is a good move, and I don't think we need to stop it. I'm sorry, we don't. All right. Another little bit about it. Russia is, I believe, trying to destabilize Poland and stop America from falling on promises to send troops. In July, a NATO summit in Warsaw, Poland, which, if you remember, a little history lesson here, Wars, there used to, when the, there was the USSR, there was the Warsaw Pact. It was the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or the, Russia's predecessor, uh, answer to NATO. And as you can guess, it was based on the name. The Warsaw Pact was signed where? Warsaw, Poland. Now, fast forward. Poland is now a member of NATO. Yes, Warsaw is now a member of NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So I kind of, I personally find it kind of ironic that the country that the Warsaw Pact was named for, which essentially fell apart when the USSR, or Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, fell apart, is now, the country that the pact was named for is now a member of NATO. The exact group the pact was designed to fight against. I mean, we have upcoming coming elections in France Germ and Germany. So, placing troops in Poland isn't a bad thing. And Russia is observing everything that happens in Poland. There were dro recently drones that violated Poland's airspace. And there's been all kinds of other little... Kerfluffles. And tensions in Poland are just like the rest of the world. Hi, it's a tinderbox. Poland is suffering many of the same sorts of problems that the rest of Europe. Racial tensions, refugee crisis, all of these things that Russia can use to manipulate Poland into a weaker date. And to follow up on a story that I believe my one of my our other hosts broke last night. Dozens of United States Special Forces a special operations force are now going to the Baltics to counter a fake f threat from Russia. What could go wrong? Not sure it's so much of a th fake threat, but take it for what you will. Vladimir Putin has been deploying nuclear-ready missiles in the Russian province of Kaliningrad, an area that borders Poland, Belarus, and Lithuania. This move has prompted the neighboring Baltic, Baltic states to become highly concerned about Russian military military activity and NATO has said this is one of the biggest military bill up on Russia's borders since the Cold War. Great Britain will also be sending fighter jets as well as troops to Romania to counter Russia in the region. Now of course Putin says it's stupid and unrealistic to think Russia would attack anyone in Europe. His American counterparts are well aware of this, but with press on NATO's expansion, you never know. Russia's intervened in the Middle East, as any regular listener to this show, or even anybody who pokes their nose at the news, gets a hint of. 
All right, moving right along. I mean, that's there's a lot going on with this. There is a lot. And they didn't say which branch of Spec Ops, but usually when they say Special Operations and don't name it, it's usually under the form of JSOC, Joint Special Operations Command. So it could be all of one type, it could be mixed types. There's no way of really telling. Doesn't it just the articles I've been pulling? Uh, the Baltic states are scared to death of Russia, according to General Raymond Thomas, head of the Pentagon's Special Operations Command. And the tiny militaries of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia are very open about that. They're desperate for our leadership and our help. Thomas, as a result, General Thomas said American commandos now have a persistent presence here with Baltic Special Operations troops after forging close ties with them over the past decade while fighting together in Iraq and Afghanistan. The U.S. brings sophisticated surveillance technology and broad sources of intelligence. The Baltic partners have a deep understanding of conventional military might as well as Moscow's increasing use of cyber warfare. Hmm... Yeah, I heard that term today. Now. Remember when Russia annexed Crimea two years ago? President Barack Obama didn't do anything other than yell, hop up and down and scream. Last week, Senators, check the date on that. Yeah, last week, Senators John McCain, Lindsey Graham, and Amy Klobuchar of Minnesota visited all three Baltic countries to reassure regional leaders who are concerned that Mr. Trump might not fully commit to their defense. In November, top commander of the American Special Operations in Europe, Major General Mark C. Schwartz, met Met with Lithuania's Chief of Defense, Lieutenant Gen General Jonas Vitutas Zukas, to discuss the security situation and military cooperation. American commandos have deployed quietly but deliberately in the past several months to send a message. Do the Russians know we're there? Of course they do, General Thomas said. The Baltic states have taken steps to increase their ability to resist overt and covert Russian advances since the Ukraine crisis began nearly three years ago. They've ordered new defense equipment. The Baltics have doubled and will double again in the orders for new defense equipment in the Baltics have doubled and will double again in the next two years. At least most likely. Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia increased spending on new defense equipment from 300, 390 million to 200, from 390 million to two, two 390 million in 2016, from up from 210. Lothia and Lithuania have the two fastest growing defense budgets in the world since 2014. And that's according to an analyst from Jane's Military. Like the other Baltic states, Estonia is a NATO member. Yes. Estonia is a member of NATO. And if you remember, Clause 5 of NATO says an attack on one is an attack on all. Lithuania has recently updated its civil defense book booklet to tell its, explain its citizens what to do in the event of Russian of, of invasion. Tens of thousands of copies have been distributed. It's most important that civilians are aware and have a will to resist. When these elements are strong, an aggressor has difficulties in creating an environment for military invasion. In 2015, Lithuania announced they would reintroduce conscription for men between the ages of 19 and 26. In addition, Lithuania's self-defense league, akin to the National Guard, is set to grow this year to about 
4,900 citizen soldiers, up from 4,600. The deployment of about a dozen American Special Operation Forces to each of the Baltic states is a part piece of larger military strategy to deter any fresh, further Russian aggression. All right. In July, during the NATO summit meeting in Warsaw, which I took great pride in the fact that that was in Warsaw, at which decisions regarding stationing multinational NATO battalions in Baltic states and Poland were made, Lithuanian general said, was quoted as saying, basing NATO forces in the country was posing a threat to stability and ties between NATO and Russia. Of course... The Lithuanian general said, immediately can, contradicted that and said he didn't say it. So, but there's a couple of places I found that quote. Who knows? This, no offense, folks, it's getting real. And they don't always announce troop movements at the Pentagon. And when I heard this movement on the Pentagon news conference today, I was like, okay, this is getting serious. All right, let me check, look one thing up. Yeah, the only audio on DVIDs, which is my main source, was Peter Cook, Pentagon, was the Pentagon press sec secretary, brief reporters about, about it. That's been the only update that's been video. Now let's check. Yeah, the other was a small story about Fort Carson, Colorado, about them casing the colors. Now, for those of you who are not uh, military oriented casing the colors means they take your battalion your brigade or battalion flag and you roll it up and you put the case literally put a case over it it's usually just basically a nylon cover for the flag and you won't open that flag again until you get to your destination. So that's what case, Casing the Colors is a fancy way of saying, yeah. And there hasn't been a whole lot of news out of Atlantic Resolve. There really hasn't been. So it's one of those things we don't hear much about it, and... That's why when it came up in today's press conference, it forced me to take a look and figure out what it was, what's going on, and why we're doing it. But now we know. My, oh my, oh my. Where has the time gone? I just noticed it is time to pay those bills. All right, we're going to discuss Mosul, the Middle East, and the double speak with Gitmo when we come back after I pay those bills. Just as a reminder, you can always follow me on Twitter at Jesse's POV.
these uncertain economic times, you've got to do whatever you can to save money. One of our biggest expenses can be our cars, especially when unexpected repair bills hit. Not anymore. If you own a vehicle with less than 130,000 miles, is less than 12 years old, has a warranty about to expire, or even no warranty at all, you could stop paying for car repairs. Roadside assistance, towing, and rental coverage are all included. Don't wait for the next repair. Make one free call right now to see if you qualify. If your vehicle is less than 12 years old, has less than 130,000 miles, even if it's out of warranty, paying for car repairs can become a thing of the past. Call us right now and get your car protected before your next repair bill hits. Get protection and no more repair bills. Call 800-696-1030. Again, 800-696-1030. That's 800-696-1030. 800 696 1030. All writers are prone to becoming so attached to our characters and stories that we struggle to see why a passage may not be working. It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our writing to full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable writers to develop and grow, shaping stories into masterpieces that can stand the test of time. Editing services are provided for all genres and all age categories. Services range from the critique of the short story through to line edits on full-length novels. We also offer assistance on generating writer's bios for your websites. We won't abandon you to the masses. We want to celebrate with you in your successes. Black Wolf Editorial Services, nurturing your writing into maturity. For a full list of services and prices, visit us at blackwolfeditorial.com. I've owned my company for 14 years now, and I can tell you that payroll is a four-letter word. I hate doing it. It eats up hours I don't have, and it costs me money I could be saving. But my accountant's too expensive, and I'm not sure who to call. But I know I need help. We're Paychex, and we take all the hassles out of small business payroll. We save you time and money. It's easy. Call, fax, or give us your payroll information securely online, and we take care of the rest. We calculate the correct taxes, manage payments and direct deposits. We even send out your checks. Payroll doesn't need to be a four-letter word anymore. We're so sure that we can save you time and money that we'll give you a month's payroll free. Just for calling 877-757-2782. Get one month's payroll for free. Call Paychex right now. 877-757-2782. That's 877-757-2782. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. Right, moving right along. I have just pulled up the transcript of yesterday's Operation Inherent Resolve and press conference, and I'm going to see, and I've got the audio from it, so give me, we're going to take just a brief shot and see if I can find the audio. It's only 35 minutes long, so we're going to take a couple shots. See if I can catch it, because it was towards the end. Yeah, we we do have uh, we do have coalition forces in northern Syria. We do have forces that are working with uh, the Turkish military uh, all the time. Um, so this is something that's ongoing. As far as exactly where they are uh, in relation to. Uh, you know, Al Bob, uh, we really don't get into the the uh, disposition of our forces exactly where they're operating from, but our forces are talking to the Turkish military all the time. Uh, you know, we have ongoing uh, working relationships to share intelligence. All right, that was clearly an update on Al Bob. Let me see what I've got here. Uh, 
Well, again, I, I just told you that uh, there had been a lot of discussion at very high levels. Uh, That's more about Turkey. I can tell by what he's saying. Let's check this one. Accelerate the advance of the Iraqi security forces. All right, let's see what this one said. Well, there have been, um, you know, a number of uh, things that have been done in order to accelerate the advance of the Iraqi security forces. Certainly, we've continued to conduct strikes uh, against the enemy. Uh, we've also increased the number uh, of advise and assist forces that are there with the, uh, the Iraqi security forces uh, command elements to help advise them as they move forward and to synchronize operations. The Iraqis have taken advantage of that uh, and that's been effective. If there are any other things that need to be done in order to do that, uh, I'm sure that there would be a request made through the appropriate channels and that would be uh, General Townsend and his leadership team to CENTCOM and up to the Secretary of Defense and the White House for approval. Revealing uh, specific numbers, could you give us an idea of how much? All right, let's see if I can find it. Try this one. Well, the arrangements uh, for the increase in advise and assist forces uh, was made to support phase two of the operation. So it's been in the last couple of weeks. Um, and then, I'm sorry, your second question is wh where they where they are. Um, they have uh, they've advised the Iraqi security forces uh, as they move forward. They remain behind the forward line of troops. Uh, you know, as far as specifically where they are, we we probably won't get into uh, in great detail. You can't say whether they're actually they've actually entered the city limits, even though the Iraqi security forces are, are relatively far into the city now. You can't even say if there's any American advisors who are in the city at all. Uh, they they have been in the city at different times. Yes. And then, um, can you just? I, I know it's two different countries. Okay, so yes, we have had U.S. Ad military advisors enter the city of Mosul. He didn't go into detail. Didn't expect him to, but yes. So. It's quite, uh, quite the interesting concept that Americans have set foot in Mosul. Now that's not the big news of the day. Let me pull up new clips I got just today. On Sunday, January 1st, U.S. forces struck two al-Qaeda vehicles that had departed a large headquarters near Sarmada, Syria. On Tuesday, January 3rd, U.S. forces struck the headquarters itself, targeting multiple vehicles and structures. Al-Qaeda's foreign terrorist fighter network used this headquarters as a gathering place, and their leaders directed terrorist operations out of this location. We continue to assess the results of these strikes, uh, but our initial assessment is that the January 1st strike killed five al-Qaeda militants and destroyed two vehicles, and January 3rd strike killed more than 15 militants, destroyed six vehicles and nine structures. Okay, so the, we have not forgotten al-Qaeda, which I thought was pretty good to hear. Here's the second clip I have for you on this. But we are confident these strikes will degrade al-Qaeda's ability to direct operations in Syria and beyond. So al-Qaeda Daesh isn't the only terrorist group running amok in Syria. I thought we all knew that, but okay. As you know, al-Qaeda remains committed to carrying out terrorist attacks against the United States, our interests, and our allies and friends. We will continue to take actions to deny any safe haven for al-Qaeda in Blah, 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 safe havens, whatever. Now, that is important to deny the safe havens, but I think we've all heard the we'll continue to take actions to deny safe havens the terrorist groups line about a thousand times. Meanwhile, in Syria, Syrian Democratic forces continue to liberate territory on the way to Raqqa, 
SDF forces have now advanced to within seven and a half kilometers of Tabka Dam and continue to make progress in clearing areas north and west of Raqqa. All right, I'm going to stop that clip there and we're going to play yesterday's clip about the Syrian dam. Since this current phase began on December 9th, the SDF have liberated more than 500 square miles of Syrian land, home to tens of thousands of people who have been brutalized by ISIL's rule. Coalition airstrikes removed a significant number of ISIL fighters, more than 70 vehicles and 200 fortifications from the battlefield. This degrades ISIL's ability to maneuver and defend the occupied cities. Of these strikes, more than 100 have taken place in the vicinity of Tabka Dam, killing many ISIL fighters, including Abu Jandal al-Kuwaiti. As you know, Kuwaiti, a prominent foreign fighter and leader, had been sent to improve ISIL's control in the region in the face of SDF's advance. Recovering the Tabka Dam from ISIL will result in return uh, Syria's largest dam to the Syrians, further allowing them to reclaim their homes and their liberty. Here's the rest of the Tabka Dam update from today. And in support of these operations, the coalition in the last 24 hours conducted 10 airstrikes, including strikes against both tactical units and the oil infrastructure that provides ISIL's shrinking financial support. All right, so we're still going after Dash. And for those of you who don't regularly listen to my show, Dash and ISIL are the same group. Dash is the Middle Eastern acronym, and I prefer it because they don't like it. So, way to go, U.S. military. All right, this was also announced, and I think this has something to do with Kim Jong-un, although he's not our focus today. He has been in recent shows, and if you've missed my past shows, just go to your favorite podcast location, type in Jesse's POV, and I'll bet you'll find it. I'm on iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, Stitcher. I'm all over the place. Blueberry Pocket Cast Podcasts. Uh, starting today and including tomorrow, ships and units from the Carl Vinson Strike Group will depart San Diego for a regularly scheduled deployment to the Western Pacific. The Nimitz- This is important because for those of you that keep track of aircraft carriers, up until this is the first time in ages we have not had a single aircraft carrier deployed. It's class aircraft carrier USS Carl Vincent, carrier air wing two, and embarked destroyer squadron one will deploy with Ticonderoga class guided missile cruiser USS Lake Champlain and Arleigh Burke class guided missile destroyers USS Michael Murphy and USS Wayne E. Meyer. So yes, we are sending, and they're going to the Asia Pacific region. I.e., they're going to Korea, folks, or over in that neighborhood. Especially with Kim Jong-un and his saber rattling, I believe, I have full belief and that's what's going on. Syria, and we will not allow Al-Qaeda to grow its capacity. Okay, we heard enough of that one. We've heard quite enough of that one. But yes, even though it doesn't always make headlines. Now, let's discuss. I have about 15 minutes left, so we are going to discuss Barack Hussein Obama and his Gitmo Taney transfers. He's planning to transfer 20, at least 22 additional detainees before he leaves office. All right, now let's see which four arrived in the Kingdom of Saud today. And by the way, as many as 19 countries, as many as 19 prisoners are scheduled to go to four additional countries Four, uh, four countries, Oman, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, po- and possibly Italy. Why you'd send Gitmo detainees to Italy is beyond my comprehension. 
And this is all before President-elect Trump is sworn into office. There will be approximately 40 prisoners left by the time Obama leaves office. Of course, this means that Barack Obama will be unable to fulfill his campaign promise to close Gitmo. The four Yemenis were all captured as part of the Afghanistan com- conflict and held up to 15 years. They were sent to Saudi Arabia because the Obama administration ruled out returning the Yemenis to their homeland because it's, it's in the middle of a civil war. Hello? No kidding. Now, let's see what we know about these detainees. All right. Give me a second. I'm having to coordinate sources on the fly, as I usually do. All right. The first one named, identified as Muhammad Rajib Sadiq Abu Ganman, G-H-A-N-M-E-N, G-H-A-N, and I didn't find that one, hang on, Let's see, um, All right, let's see. Let me scan this a little bit. There's a list here of cleared to go. Muhammad Ganman is a 42 is approximately 42 years old. He's a veteran Yemeni extremist who fought in Bosnia in the 1990s. He'd been jailed in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia for a plot to smuggle missiles and then guard bin, guarded bin Laden. He told interrogators he knew about attacks bigger than 9-11. He's been ta- detained since 2002. Salam Ahmed Hadi bin Kandad find him in the list. Like I said, I'm having to search this one. I'm having to search this one because it was 40 pages long and I did not want to print a 40 page document. Afghan veteran Salam Ahmed Hadi was, a pri- was at a prison where an uprising and claimed the life of CI special operator Johnny Mike Spann, the first American to die in Afghan combat. Salam Ahmed Hadi, the Yemeni, had been a subcommander in bin Laden's 50, 55th Arab Brigade handpicked fighting force when he was captured in the autumn of 2001 as Taliban and Al Qaeda lost in Afghanistan. He was held prisoner in Mazar-e-Sharif. He and hundreds of others took part in the uprising. So he was part of killing a CIA operative. And we just let him go. Oh, yes. See if I can find the next name on this list. Fortunately, Abdullah is a very common Middle Eastern name. It's Abdullah Yeha Yusef Al Shibli. Let me try the last name Shibli. Probably spelled differently because that's the thing about these. Middle Eastern names, there is more than one way to spell them.
Abdullah al Shibli, the former honey salesman, went to Afghanistan from Yemen up to two years before 9 11 and may have received advanced training. He was captured as Al Qaeda forces fled Tora Bora 2002. All right, and the last name on this list, as far as the ones that were already transferred to the Kingdom of Saud, is Muhammad Bawazir. And... Mohammed Bawazir reportedly agreed to be a voluntary suicide operate, operative in a suicide attack inside Guantanamo Bay. He's approximately 35 or 36. The Yemeni fought with bin Laden's Arab forces in Afghanistan as well as with the Taliban itself. He refused to get on a plane earlier last year to be transferred to another country because he did not want to go where he had no relatives. So he's being a special snowflake on top of it all. Now, some of the other characters on this list. Mustafa al-Shamiri was said to be a member of the Yemeni cell responsible for the USS Cole attack in 2000, which claimed the lives of 17 United States Navy sailors. The detainee is a veteran jihadist who participated in hostilities in the 1994 Yemeni Civil War, the Bosnian Jihad, and the Bosnian Jihad in the 1990s. Abik al-Rahim Nashiri, senior al-Qaeda operational coordinator who worked directly under bin Laden, has also been cleared to go. He linked up to a dozen plots to attack the U.S. and Western interests, including the USS Cole bombing. Although he's a Saudi, he was born in Yemen, although he, was a, he is a Saudi citizen. He's now charged with war crimes, although he's been cleared to be released. Abu Zabaydah, Palestinian, was a senior al-Qaeda member involved in numerous terror plots, including the USS Cole bombing and a plan to attack U.S. power grids. He ran a major training camp, and he's been held since 2006. I only have time to cover a couple more of these. I will send put, post the link to this on my site. Hambali, a.k.a. Redu, Reduan, is, is Maduin Dean, once the so-called Osama bin Laden of Southeast Asia. The Indian Asian wanted to create a Muslim caliphate across much of it with himself as the caliph. He oversaw the Bali, Bali nightclub bombing, which killed 202 people. And it was the worst of his attack of his Jamaat Islamiyah terror group. He was also behind the wave of church, a wave of church bombings in Indonesia. While he met two of the 9-11 hijackers at an Al-Qaeda summer in Malaysia, he was captured in Thailand with arms and explosives. Who else is free to go? Gibran al Katani. He's approximately 40. He's a Saudi born electrical engineer. He helped build IEDs to attack American forces in Afghanistan. He has vowed to go back to killing Americans if he's released and threatened to sat assassinate the Afghan president and the Saudi king because he says they are Americans. Majid Khan, Pakistani citizen who graduated Owings Mill High School in Cantonsville, Maryland, went back to Pakistan to find a wife, returned to the U.S., worked in a government office in Maryland, but enlisted in Al-Qaeda by Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. And Mohammed had encouraged him to plot terror attacks in Israel and the U.S. with targets including gas stations and re reservoirs. He was captured in Karachi along with his brother and other relatives. 
some of those were already freed. Walid Zaid, possible Al Qaeda money courier before 9 11. He was at a training camp, camp in Afghanistan. He was wounded at Tora Bora as he manned a fighting position. Let's see, who else do we have here? Maud Fariq bin Amin, Malaysian, who was part of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's plot for even more hijackings on the West Coast after 9-11. He had trained in terror in Afghanistan, personally swore allegiance to Osama bin Laden and cased targets in Thailand, Thailand and Cambodia for, for attacks. Mohammed bin Lep is also a Malaysian fanatic. He was another Al -Qaeda, uh, aid to Al Qaeda Hambali. Among plots he was involved in was the attack on, on a Marriott in Jakarta. Uled Hassan Darud. Darud was a Somali plotting to attack the U.S. base in nearby hotels in Jib Djibouti in the Horn of Africa. Muhammad Abdul Malik, Kenyan member of Al-Qaeda in East Africa, was part of the gang behind the 2002 bombing of an Israeli-owned hotel in Mombasa, which killed three Israeli tourists and ten Kenyans. Almost simultaneously, two surface-to-air missiles were filed, uh, fire, fired at an Israeli charter flight leaving the nearby airport. Ahmed Mohammed Al Darbi was an instructor at the Farouk Camp and Advanced Instruction Center for Afghan Al Qaeda in Afghanistan before 9 11. There, the Saudi Arabian taught its operatives how to use Kalashnikov rifles and anti aircraft weapons. Ismail Al Bakush was Libyan born. He, is, he was a jihadi in his own country before swearing field. Fealty to Islam bin Laden before 9-11. He taught bond making at Al-Qaeda's advanced training camp. He was captured in Pakistan after fleeing Afghanistan, along with a series of other terrorist suspects. All right, we have time for one more. And these are all people that are President Obama is cleared to release. Oh, yes, you heard me, just to remind you. Rida al Yazidi, Emir of Al Qaeda's Tunisian faction, Afghanistan, who fought in combat and whose commitment to jihad went back to the 1990s when he was a wanted terrorist. All right, there wasn't much on him. Let's see what else I have. Muaz al Alawi, he's another Yemeni who was frontline fighter for the Taliban, having picked up an AK 47 at the age of eight. He also ran a guest house in Kandahar for Al Qaeda fanatics. Uthman Abdul Rahim Muhammad Uthman, a Yemeni who was a bodyguard for Osama bin Laden and took part in weapons training and fighting in Afghanistan. Muhammad Al Ansi, a bin Laden, also a bin Laden bodyguard from Yemen, who'd also trained to be a suicide plane attacker in Southeast Asia. In a plot supposedly happened to happen on 9-11. Ramzi bin al-Shib, -Shib, once Muhammad Atta's roommate and originally supposed to be one of the 9-11 pilots, the Yemeni was turned down for a visa and instead became a coordinator, even giving Atta the date for the atrocities. He was one of the most FBI's most wanted until his capture in 2002 in a gun battle. Trial on mil murder charges by the military commission has has yet to happen, despite charges being brought in 2008, and he is now cleared for release. All right, folks, I am officially out of time. I will get this information pulled together. I may do a special just on these prisoners. And on that note, folks, as always, you can find me on Twitter at Jesse's POV. And I will see you next time. I'm out of here!